Hello, and uh, welcome to Academics at Google Talks. Um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce Kai Kohlhoff today, with whom I've worked for the past four years at Google on a project called ExaCycle. Today, he's going to announce and show some very exciting results from using ExaCycle for simulating proteins. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about ExaCycle and why it's important. ExaCycle is a computing platform at Google that uses our massive data centers to carry out extraordinarily large and complex simulations. This has been a problem in science for a very long time, where scientists were not able to get access to really large amounts of computing power. This has been changing over the past few years, especially with the cloud. However, with the cloud, there are a number of things that you have to do to optimize your applications to run very quickly. So we built an application called ExaCycle that enables scientists to carry out core, millions of core simulations that run for months or years at a time. And then also, because we're Google, we need to be able to analyze enormous amounts of data. And so along with ExaCycle, we created a technology called Flume, which makes it really easy to process large amounts of data. So working with Kai Kohlhoff, um, whom I met four years ago at Stanford, uh, we took the ExaCycle system and ran some very complicated calculations on it. Uh, to give some background, uh, we do something called molecular dynamic simulations, which are literally the application of Newton's equations to um, proteins. And if you run these kinds of simulations, you can often get insights into how the systems work and behave in the real world. You can take those models and that information and use it to improve industrial products and pharmaceutical products like drugs. And so Kai will give a lot of details but, um, uh, about how the system works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of how ExaCycle itself works and why it's important. So Google, in building out its infrastructure to serve search results for people, has to size its system for peak capacity. However, in the middle of the night, many of those systems, when people aren't searching, have idle cycles. So what we do is we built a system that uses our idle cycles to do computing. And we have a lot of idle cycles because at peak, we have to serve a lot of users. Um, so I took a system, it was influenced by SETI at home and folding at home, uh, basically treat our systems like massive farms of desktop computers available for computing. This actually raises a number of really challenging problems such as uh, dealing with data at scale and making sure that you don't melt down data centers. So after a number of years of work, Kai was able to run a number of simulations and um, he's assembled the results here, and he's going to be showing that in advance of um, a publication coming out in Nature Chemistry. So without further ado, let me introduce Kai. Kai, um, I met Kai um, about four years ago when he wanted to be uh, a bioinformatics intern at Google. However, he was a postdoc, and postdocs can't be interns at Google. So instead, we hired him as a visiting faculty and gave him the resources that he needed to carry out his work. Kai has now become a full-time researcher at Google and continues to work on exciting problems. So, Dr. Kohlhoff, welcome. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction. Yes, yeah, so that was actually quite surprising. Like, I was hoping to spend try, uh, three to six months here just trying to get some bioinformatics algorithms working with some of Google's technologies. And then after I actually went through the whole application process and was ready for host matching, Someone found out, well, you got a PhD, you're not going to be able to come here and do anything because we're not taking PhDs for the intern program. But luckily, uh, they found a different way of getting me in. And part of that is actually a pretty interesting part of the story, um, which really surprised me as well at the time. So just a little bit for the background. I was working as a bioinformatician in the bioengineering de department at Stanford. I was mainly focusing on protein simulations so basically, physics-based simulations of biological systems. And with more and more, more and more of the life sciences being treated as information sciences, this is kind of natural interest for many people in Google uh, for doing things at scale. And also like just the cu curiosity of it, like how can things work at this scale? How do we efficiently work? And it really came as a surprise to me. Like I had an idea that some people at Stanford, at, at Google might be interested in biology or doing bioinformatics applications, but that there was actually someone here working on implementing a system that was at least in parts inspired by the kind of uh, large-scale distributed computing that we were doing at Stanford and the kind of science application that we were working on. That really surprised me and it was a very nice surprise uh, being able to come here and continue my work. 
So I was working on a class of proteins called G protein coupled receptors. They sit in the cell membrane and they act a little bit like a switch. So you can imagine that like they sense molecule from outside the cell and they switch on or off depending on what kind of molecules they are. So for example, they bind to epinephrine or they bind to caffeine or they bind to beta blockers. So what makes them so interesting also is that about half of the existing medication interacts with G protein coupled receptors. So there's a big interest in the pharmaceutical sciences in this class of proteins. So think about this, like someone like me right now standing here in front of you and talking is probably on a lot more stress than the rest of you in the room. So you can imagine that I have more epinephrine going through my body. And so you will actually find a lot more active G protein coupled receptors telling my heart to, to beat faster and telling my brain to look out for predators. So the thing is that because of all these processes are taking place, you have to make sure that any medication you send into the body doesn't interact with too many of these receptors. And that's actually very difficult because many of these receptors are very similar in structure and bind to similar uh, molecules. So for example, if you take an asthma medication, it will bind to one receptor and it will kind of relax your muscles. But at the same time, it will bind to a very closely related second receptor and it will make your heart beat faster. So you have side effects that you want to avoid. So that's why we have to study G-protein coupled receptors in more detail and understand how they work. So let's take a look at one. This is a system I've been studying most of the time. This is an adrenergic receptor. And just for comparison, you have something like this, which is actually a relatively small protein. It's three amino acids just hooked together. Something like this has about 340 amino acids. So it's a very different scale. But we can model this in the computer. To get a system like this from a database, Someone has taken the effort to um, determine the structure using X-ray crystallography, so we know pretty well where all the atoms sit. And then we just model that. We take the 3D coordinates, and then we add a patch of cell membrane, because this receptor sits in, the sits in the membrane. So if you want to simulate it, we need to have the lipid bilayer in there. And next step, we have to put it in solvent, so that it becomes closer and closer to what you actually see in the cell. And then we add some ions for good measure to make sure that the electrostatics um, work correctly. And so now you have this protein in a box. And this is your simulation system, ready to work. But to actually be able to simulate this in the computer, you need to apply the physics of it. So you need to describe the system using a set of equations. And that's kind of what's amazing about the system, because people have been able to create the set of equations that describes all the interactions between the atoms and approximate the behavior. Behavior, and it fits on one slide, but still, it's extremely computationally expensive. Um, the one thing you see here, the one equation, is Newton's second law of motion. So basically, just saying if you know the forces on all of the, the particles in the system, and if you know their masses, then we can calculate the acceleration on them. And that's what we're using when we drive our simulations. So here's an example of an actual simulation one. You will now recognize the different parts. You have the protein. You have some ions here. The solvent is not shown. It would be too much. Um, and you have the lipid membrane. And so let's get this started. Oh, that's pretty bad. This is actually what it would look like if you have very low sampling. And just save like every couple of, of well, not really nanoseconds, but just, let's say, every tenth frame. So really on my screen, it's very liquid, it's very fluid, and you can see how the, the membrane moves and how the protein moves. But I think you get an impression like how much is just moving there and how much is just happening in a very short time span. Because believe it or not, but this is a three minute video, and it's only five nanoseconds of actual chemical time. So all of these movements you see, they happen on the nanosecond scale. And we have to simulate on the femtosecond scale to capture all these tiny movements that are happening there. So you have that. You have to go from the fem to, uh, fem to second scale to the nanosecond scale by just running the simulations for that long. At the same time, you have all of these atoms, there are about 60,000 in this, in this system, that all interact with one another through electrostatics and van der Waals forces and long-range forces, which uh, basically interfere with the, the movement of all these atoms. OK. So creating this movie took about 10 days on a single CPU. So there you have three different time scales. But basically it tells you that 
getting to the nanoseconds takes days on a single CPU. And it doesn't actually show you that much. On a nanosecond, what you see is pretty much only um, the one of these little side chains here will maybe flip position, something like this. So that's not really telling you that much about the activity of the protein and what it can do. So we have to run for even longer time scales. So what I want to show with this slide is basically just the, the difference between the different time scales. So again, for nanoseconds, you might see a flip in one of these little side chains. And that might actually be irrelevant already because it might mean that some hydrogen bond or salt bridges form. And they might be the first step of this protein doing something. So I told you it's like a switch. So basically, you want to see, does it switch on and how does it work? Um, but the switch would be the whole protein doing something, not just one of the side chains. So we are definitely looking for that. We need to have that kind of resolution. We need to understand how everything happens step by step. But it's not the most interesting part. If you go to microsecond simulations, you're getting to something where you can see a, a ligand binding to it. So it's a small molecule coming from the outside. There will be the top outside of the cell binding to the protein, to the receptor, and then it ac activates. So that happens on the microsecond time scale. But microseconds is already something where you need a lot of processing power. You can do nanoseconds on your own computer, but for microseconds, you're actually already pushing the boundaries of what's available to most people today. But we want to go further than that. We want to really be there. We want to be somewhere in the milliseconds uh, time scale because that's when really the big, bigger things happen. That's when the whole receptor has time to change shape and activate. Because all we want to see is what happens if something binds on the extracellular side. What happens on the intercellular side? Does it change shape as well? And how does it bind other proteins? And what happens exactly? So to get there, basically, what you have available in academia nowadays is you have your own workstation. You can run these short simulations. You normally have pooled resources, like a group cluster, which has a number of 100 cores. Um, but it's shared. You have to compete with other group members. And then you might have departmental, university-wide, or national computer centers, which give you maybe a few hundred more CPU cores. But all of these have in common that you have to share them. So it's pretty unlikely that you get several thousand cores, which you might need for running long, long timescale um, simulations. So there needs to be some other solution. But the way it was done so far is that basically you take this protein in a box and you subdivide it. You just split it up according to all three dimensions. And so if you have eight cores, you just split it and you give each core one part of the protein to simulate. But then you start having problems because you have to transfer forces across these boundaries. So one of these boxes has to know what happens in the other box. Because otherwise, all your simulations would go wrong. But that's what people have been doing to speed up the processing. And you can keep doing that, adding more and more cores and more and more subdivisions. But since these individual parts are growing smaller and smaller, you end up having very little to uh, simulate on each individual core. So you're spending more and more time just transferring data. And so like in many supercomputing applications, what you get is imperfect scaling. What you want to have is this ideal scaling where you double the number of processors and you double the number of the, the output, basically, the efficiency. But what you see here is uh, what the reality of it is, that you just add the number of cores, but you lose a lot. So after like about 100 cores, you're already down to 50% of the total efficiency that you could have. And then it just keeps flattening out. So even if you had thousands of, of, of uh, cores available, using this mechanism, it's probably not very much faster than having 200 cores or something like this. So this is not the way forward. Eventually what you have to do is run several simulations in parallel, um, and that way recover some of the, the lost efficiency. OK, so that's the other idea. You just have a lot of copies. And in the extreme case, you just have one copy per core. And now you actually have perfect scaling, because you just double the number of cores, and you get twice uh, the throughput. It seems kind of silly to do that, because why would you simulate the same system over and over again? The difference there is that you introduce a random number, and you change the starting condition so that each atom actually gets a different velocity in initially. And so that drives the system basically into different uh, directions, so it evolves independently for each of these simulations. And so you kind of spread it out, and you do this sampling over the available phase space for your proteins. And this is kind of the idea um, that has been followed for more than 10 years by Vijay Pandey and his group at Stanford. So they have basically had the system, which is very similar to SETI at home, if you've heard about that. 
um, where basically people just download a client program, and while their system is idle, they just run the screensaver and it computes, it computes um, work units that it gets from, from Stanford, and it does it for a number of days and then returns the result, and then Stanford goes about and analyzes the results. So there's something like 250,000 uh, CPUs at any given time. There's a problem with this though, because since these are individuals, these are um, people like you and me, just using their home computer, they might decide to just switch off their machine and maybe never switch it on again, or maybe just not use the screensaver again anymore. So you have sent out your, your work unit and it never comes back. So you have to be aware of that. So sometimes it takes a while till you have sent out your, your work again and have collected all of it. It's also a shared uh, resource, but we were able to actually use this initially when I was still at Stanford. And I um, did 10,000 simulations of the protein that I showed you. And so that was a good start just to show that the system was actually uh, stable and working. Now, when I heard from Dave what he was doing and what the scale was, that was of course like a very different beast because ExoCycle is not just able to have hundreds of thousands of cores, but in excess of a million, of co a million cores working on your protein. So now you can have your parallel uh, simulations and just have 10,000 jobs or 100,000 jobs running at the same time with a really good throughput. So it's basically an enormous batch processing system. You just submit your work. You eventually get it back. Um, ExoCycle just goes out there and finds the cycles for you. You don't have to take care of that. And it was also part of the uh, grant pro program which gave away 1 billion CPU hours. So the Google actually showed that you know, just take all this uh, compute power that we have and just do something good with it and, and create some, some valuable science. So we had a chance to work on a, about 100,000 cores for about half a year. That is about the, the equivalent that we got. So um, doing that with hundreds of uh, millions of CPU hours obviously gave us a lot of data. And that allowed us to do something what you see on the right hand side. So you start from a starting confirmation. Let's say it's A, let's say that's the off uh, confirmation for this switch that you have. And then you just start sampling, you just spread out your work. And then after a while you just collect all the data and you look at it. And you see like, okay, so what of my, which of my trajectories, which of my runs have actually uh, proceeded the furthest? And where did I do all the sampling? Like the, the areas I have sampled a lot, I don't have to sample any further. So I'm just picking some structures for the next simulation run. And I kind of spread, keep spreading out like this. And so eventually I will get to state B using this process. The other extreme is if you use like really specialized hardware, like in the, on the left-hand side where you have uh, the Anton supercomputer, which was specifically built just to run molecular dynamic simulations. But there you have like a number of cores that work on the same protein. And eventually you have a problem with scaling where you just can't have smaller and smaller uh, subdivisions. But this is a, a way where you can have to create a very long trajectory. And the advantage is that once you get from state A to state B, you can go back and replay this, this movie essentially and you see what happens. What are the dynamics taking place? What are the structural changes taking place that get the protein from one to, to the other? Okay, so that makes it easier. Um, we have a lot of data now and actually coming to Google, suddenly I had like two orders of, of magnitude more data to work with. Uh, so that's a bit of a challenge. So what do you do with that? The answer is of course, go back to the cloud and do the analysis there. So we used something called Markov state models. It was also developed at, at Stanford mainly. And it basically takes all these individual trajectories and it clusters them together. So you have a number of different states. But because these small trajectories actually sometimes migrate from one state to another one, you have these transitions as well. Like you get a probability of how likely it is that a protein that starts here goes to this other state. Um, and then in comparison to whatever other path it can take. So like this example shows, there might be several different ways that you go from A to B. And actually you might have, you might go back sometimes as well. So actually these arrows should go both ways. But that tells you something about what's happening. And in our case, analyzing all the data we had, um, showed us that you have a number of pathways that go from the inactive state of the, of the receptor to the active state. And that's actually something that we didn't anticipate and something we weren't sure we could actually see. So we basically just let the simulations run and we were just letting ourselves be surprised by the outcome. There wasn't really like a clear plan what, how far we might be able to get with this. But it was amazing to see how far this, this, this led us um, using all the compute power that we had. Okay, so now when you have the pathways, here's one thing you can do with that. So you know the protein goes in different ways. 
now you can see like okay what happens with these molecules like the beta blockers and things like that that bind to your receptor that activate it, yeah, uh, inactivate it and so you have two different examples here where you basically just um, do some 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 docking between the, pro uh, the molecule shown here and that, that big protein and just see along this this uh, pathway going from the inactive state on the left to the active state on the right, so it's basically a percentage of progress along that trajectory, uh, where does this bind? And the interesting result is that, for example, the one on the top, which activates the protein, it doesn't bind in the beginning, it doesn't bind the inactive state. You actually have to proce uh, um, have proce process along the activation pathway for a while before it actually starts binding. So that's interesting because if all you have is the inactive state and you think you want to develop a drug molecule for it, maybe the most efficient drug molecule doesn't bind. Maybe because the protein is fluctuating between inactive and active in some degree, you need to have something that just goes to the active state and then um, stabilizes it. And the other extreme is uh, the second example, which is actually inactivating the, the receptor. And similarly, it mainly binds to the, to the inactive state and it's not really on the protein the whole duration of it changing from active to inactive. So you can take this into account when you start developing drug molecules. And there's a lot more information in there. We actually have written this up, and I think we have more than 40 pages um, in supplemental information in the paper that's coming out, just doing this kind of, of uh, analysis. OK, just to summarize the results. So what we have shown really is that you can use cloud computing to do these kind of simulations. And it's kind of the way that you think about it. Like, Basically, what people start out with is that they just learn, okay, we just throw more and more CPUs at it, and we just subdivide it further. But people are not really aware that some applications, if you find the right algorithms and the right approach, you can actually go to the cloud and be at least as efficient. And in our case, we actually have created the largest data set for, um, for G-protein-coupled receptors. And that was only possible because of the large scale that ExoCycle enabled us to use. This shows that the cloud is, is, is there, the cloud is, uh, something we can use as a useful tool, allows us to scale, allows us to have ca capacity when we need it, and not have to wait for the couple of hundred cores that I want to run for the next three weeks just to see whether or not my experiment works. The other advantage is that I was actually given a lot of time at Stanford to start researching G-protein coupled receptors, and that's something you might not necessarily have at a, at a company. So in this way, by just working with scientists from university, you um, get kind of the best of both worlds where, where you can do the, the fundamental research at the university but then take it to scale and basically throw all this compute power at it and, and get somewhere very, very quickly. The third thing is that hopefully in the future scientists don't really have to bother so much with setting up their own servers anymore and the technical aspects of it. But just basically send it off to the cloud, someone else takes care of it and you just focus on your science. It's surprising that a lot of people don't really know that Google is doing research in any field. I keep getting that feedback. Um, but that Google is doing something in, in biology is what really surprises a lot of people. And I think this way we can also create the awareness that you know, not only is Google doing some research, you can also go as a scientist and, and use Google for doing your research. And then hopefully as a big vision in the future, you have everything in the cloud. You have the data in the cloud. You have the analysis in the cloud. So you start having this kind of uh, continuous progress where people can go and continue working on your data. They can reproduce the results and then they just do their own analysis on top of it. And so basically you don't you have shared resources, you don't have to have this, this, this silo building where everyone does their own things and doesn't share, but you can really collaboratively go about it and have um, continuous, uh, continuous conversation about this re research. And this is probably the slide that makes me personally the proudest because after almost five years of research, we have been able to now get a paper accepted in Nature Chemistry, summarizing all the results, working on ExoCycle and the hard work done at, at um, Stanford by our collaborators there. And so I'm actually showing like the different people involved in, at Google and at Stanford. And the cover page here, there will be a cover page of the Nature Chemistry issue in January coming out next week. And it was um, created by one of our, uh, our colleagues in the Katamari group, Sir Lewis. And so he helped us to actually get on the cover and be featured there as well. And so, yeah. So that actually uh, ends it and just shows that we have had impact with this program. Okay, thanks a lot. Actually, I think David wants to say something before we have questions.
Thank you very much, Kai. That was very exciting. It's really thrilling to see after a number of years of hard work that the science has paid off and that our ideas are making it out into the academic community and we hope we have an impact. Um, and further, what I'd like to say is that Google has, over the past few years, started to enter the cloud business. And my feeling is, after seeing this project work successfully, that I think our cloud is ready for science. And I think as a scientist, it's really in your interest to understand how to use our systems and take advantage of them. Because in the future, access to enormous amounts of computing power are going to make the difference between successful scientists and unsuccessful ones. So if you start looking at what we're doing and read our papers and figure out kind of the techniques that we're using and look at open source projects like Hadoop, you should start adopting the ideas that, that we're promoting and that the Hadoop people are promoting. There's a lot of really great ideas there that help scientists focus more on the interesting questions they have. And that's really what science is about, is attempting to answer questions, less so the actual engineering of how bytes move around between computers. Thank you.